uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my perspective here will be a little bit um, ambiguous, ambivalent. First of all, I'm speaking um, on behalf of the Slavic department, the only one left in Canada, which is kind of mainstream, normal, and anomalous. Second, uh, my position is doubly anomalous in a way that uh, not only this is the only Slavic department yet uh, left in Canada, but it's the only Slavic department, I think, that has two Ukrainianists, um, my colleague Maxim Tarnavsky and I. And it's it just, um, well, it's nice, of course, to have two Ukrainianists in a one single last Slavic department. But again, it's, um, it's a result of bureaucratic rules and cir cir uh, circumstances. It's neither my fault nor my particular um, accomplishments that it happened that way. But this is what happened. And initially, ending up a second Ukrainianist in a small Slavic department, you have to do what you have to do. Uh, teaching a number of straight Ukrainian courses, quote unquote, uh, you have to develop, including second, third year Ukrainian language, survey courses, and so on. But the problem of two Ukrainianists is it's a small field. Uh, and two people competing for the same pool of students is obviously not very healthy or helpful. So this leads, led me to carve out a field uh, for myself. And in this case, my perspective will be personal, but also it probably has some other uh, potential for um, approaching, expanding. So I had to design courses between and outside the lines of disciplines and various Slavic and other cultures. This task was um, somewhat easier on me because I, I studied Czech, Russian, Ukrainian in my undergraduate years at Lviv University and, and then in my graduate years at Harvard. I could read Polish, that, that was helpful as well. But the main challenge was to design, and it, it remains as such, to design, package, and contextualize interdisciplinary courses around a certain compelling or inevitable idea, theme, or place with the hope that they would be attractive for students. Since all of these courses that proceeded are taught and read in English, they are very much dependent on availability of good texts in preferably good translations. So over the years, this is what, what occurred, what happened. So, and this is what I teach, and hopefully and helpfully, these courses um, plug into my various research projects. Um, the cultural history of Kiev certainly is deserving a place in any uh, cultural curricula. Now its title, after Kiev, Kiev itself as a title becomes any national title or any particular title, specific title place becomes more tenuous as a packaging uh, device. It's called now the City of Saints and Sinners. Fits Kiev quite well. A survey of chief modernist and avant-garde movements in the late Russian Empire and early Soviet years, uh, currently titled after Philon of Universal Flowering. Faking it course, uh, which upon the insistence of arts and science appears in students' transcripts as forgery and culture. Um, an overview of Slavic book culture from St. Cyril's and Metodius to Hrabal, uh, overview of Gogol, the Ukrainian father of Russian prose of sorts and a little Russian and um, introductory survey of Ukrainian-Russian civilizations, roughly from Herodotus to Mazepa and Peter. Fortunately, these courses became useful to uh, my department as they qualify for several programs for all or most minors and majors in our department, so it m makes them meaningful and useful. And in addition to creating this niche, all of them allowed, indeed forced me, to resituate Ukrainian content within broader cultural and disciplinary frameworks. It is certainly easier to teach a survey of Russian literature or Russian novel or Russian short story with textbooks, anthologies, um, all kind of resources at your disposal. It would have been uh, perhaps easier to teach a survey of Ukrainian novel or Ukrainian short story, but times have changed. It is a matter of administrative pressure and educational marketing, cultural branding, and recognition of such brands. Russian novel, Russian short story, literature of Russian golden age, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and so on, 
these are brands that attract students and guarantee enrollments. Even among Ukrainian students and students of Ukrainian descent, Canadian students, we are likely to find them in a survey of Russian rather than Ukrainian novel, for example. Same is true for other national cultures as well, Polish drama, Czech short story, and so on. So the traditional national adjective is not sufficient to have an audience. Other Ukrainian novels on par with Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, Ukrainian stories to die for, Ukrainian drama to salivate about. Well, Ukrainian literature has marvelous texts, for sure. We all can point to such examples as Krimsky, Pidmohilny, Domantovich for novels, Stefanik Kotsubinsky for stories, Ukrainka and Kulish for drama. Certainly contemporary Ukrainian literature is on par with anything good in any literature. But again, the only recognizable brand remains Russian for good or bad reasons. One can imagine students reading hundreds of pages of War and Peace or Anna Karenina, they do it by virtue of the share of cultural market the Russian cultural legacy occupies in the West um, accumulated over the past 150 years, that's what it is. Second problem is the problem of translations. Third problem is text selections uh, and texts and reading. Uh, what was said yesterday about uh, the habits of reading today is true. Today, students on average have two-page attention span, unless there is some magic. Reading and literacy in the post-Gutenberg world, that is Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, revolution age, is neither intensive nor extensive. It is reading of captions. It is pixelated and pulverized reading. And, and that is true, that we have to deal with that and overcome it uh, somehow. And how to sustain reading and teaching or reading practices in this environment is one major task all teachers of all literature face. So let's return to our Ukrainian packages, our material. In all of these courses that I teach, I have to, it, it, it is after all my vocation to feature Ukrainian content and to frame it in a way that makes it both distinctive and attractive. A student uh, taking the Google course with five out of 12 weeks focusing on Ukrainian themes will see the writer as an example of cultural hybridity, blackface performance, as well as a product and victim of his forked tongue. That's a little revenge after all, perhaps for decades of scholarship ignorant or neglectful of Ukrainian Google. In packaging and framing the Ukrainian content, it is usually it works best either by zooming in on this content or by opening it up. It's not always easy. Building thematic courses from scratch is like doing a bathroom run on your own. You have no idea nearly until the end if the framing works and if the lighting and accents of your choice will match your vanity. Opening up Ukrainian material with Kiev, for example, and it's a great, uh, I think, theme or focus it is most productive to emphasize the dynamics of change, interaction, and competition in the formation of the real and the virtual imagined city. Grand, devastated, peripheral, metropolitan, revolutionary. The capital of contemporary Ukraine emerges through competition of narratives, legacies, and voices. In this context, it is possible and actually effective to teach Bulgakov's White Guard, framed with Kuprin's Yama, Shalom Aleichem's Menahem Mendel, and Venechenko's Zilas Friend and Pidmohilny's Misto. The latter two works do not suffer in comparison, neither does Kyiv as the capital of Ukraine. And by the way, Pidmohilny is available, Andriyu, in, in, in enough of English chunks to, to be taught. Uh, the future possibilities, perhaps, perhaps urban experiences, literary colonizations, uh, of city spaces within Ukraine. Uh, Moscovia, Schulz, Hravel, Venechuk can be put together. Now, zooming down in thematic courses, uh, sometimes they're most satisfactory when a Ukrainian piece provides a dessert, d dessert, a concluding touch to the whole enterprise of a course. Everything suddenly comes to a focus, technicolor and all. Uh, these are my personal favorites. Uh, when one takes Domantovich's Bezgruntu at the conclusion of the survey of modernism and avant-garde, uh, this provides an amazing and, of course, ironic commentary 
on traditional modernist and avant-garde aesthetics and much more. The, Ukrainian, the Ukrainianness of this text has a most brilliant and poignant universality. Taking uh, Valery Shevchuk's The Eye of the Abyss at the end of the uh, course on forgery, when the nature of miracles, manufacturing of, a, of the faith, and infinite recycling of stories as they bleed into life and vice versa is revealed in the midst of 16th century Ukraine, Ruthenia, torn by social duress, moral depravity, and outside forces. The topic becomes historical and yet a temporal universal. And then, of course, packaging. Maybe the time will come for a mega course Ukrainian novel. Who knows who will follow Andrukhovich and Jadan? In any case, contemporary Ukrainian literature can be successfully thematized and taught today with what's available. And I do hope to build a course on a single Ukrainian novel opened up to a broad intercultural, interdisciplinary context. That is Bezgruntu by Domantovich, with overarching theme title, Roots and Rootlessness. Uh, this is no war, peace, uh, war and peace, of course. Uh, it is in some ways more than war and peace, and Anna Karenina together, and Natasha's dance, and so on. Uh, the richness of this unique novel allows one to engage in a tremendous range of texts, legacies, and ideas. It has it all. Commentary of a range of artistic movements, histori historiosophical meditation, sexual drive and indeterminacy, music, politics, infinite depths of history, infinite dross and fragmentation of culture. The main problem, translation is inadequate. It, it exists but must be redone. But even this inadequate translation does the trick. So perhaps to sh it would be useful for uh, the small pool of uh, us teachers of Ukrainian literature uh, to create some, I would certainly uh, be happy to, to have some virtual space for sharing uh, educational ideas, tricks, texts, experiences, uh, trying to uh, inspire one another. Uh, we have some venues already, and I, uh, I especially want to point to my colleagues Maxim Tarnavsky's uh, page Ukrainian Literature at U of T uh, website, Slavic Department's website, that has remarkable number of sources, both in Ukrainian and English. Uh, we probably need more. And the future of Ukrainian curriculum in those more traditional departments would be certainly a combination of something more familiar, courses, surveys in restructured, of course, and repackaged format, and courses, thematic courses, uh, where Ukraine is a main dish or a dessert. Um, and in today's environment, which gravitates to relentless um, corporatization of learning, we still have to emphasize that culture and literature should remain and should be expanded as venues for discussions of society and human condition in general. And the field is certainly worthy of life's efforts. Uh, here I would second uh, our uh, presenters, uh, Mark and Yaroslav and Rory. Ukrainian, literature, Ukrainian culture and literature is capable of providing access and insight into the most relevant, complex, and powerful human experiences. And we should try to put it out with the best, without apologies or reservations. Thank you. <laughs>